Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Power of Story and Science. I'm your host, David Ode. And as you know, on this show, we have content and conversations. And this episode is a conversation with Keith Bailey, whom I've gotten to know recently and realized how much we have in common when it comes to storytelling. Because as you're aware, story is a big theme of mine when it comes to having better technical presentations, because that's how you connect with people at a human level. And as I know you've heard me say, your information goes nowhere if you don't meet the needs of your audience. And what does your audience need from you? They need information from a trusted source. How do you build that trust? That's what we'll be talking about today when it comes to storytelling, because that's how you build a relationship with your audience. Would you agree, Keith? I 100% uh, agree with that. Uh, stories are the foundation of our of our being, right? It's, if you look back over time, it's not the facts and the figures that you hear, but it's the stories that you hear and, and the, the, the meaning behind that story is what ends up uh, living longest. I had a conversation the other day with uh, a prospective client and we're talking about the content and data and facts fade when they stand alone. Stories have a tendency to stick when you tie mm. stories into facts, figures, and, and content, then they become memorable. Stories stick. What a great phrase. Oh, thank you. Nice and short and, and alliterative. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is it that you do in your work to help people create and use stories that stick? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking, David. When I started my own business about three years ago, I started working with business professionals and oftentimes they would, they would come to me with an already ready to go presentation. And I would look to the presentation and ask them, I go, what is the one takeaway of this presentation? Like, oh, I want to get this point across and this point across and this point across. Okay. But what's the one thing you want them to take away? And we would really just marinate it all down, boil it down till we got to what's the one thing. Everybody has content. Data is, is prolific. We've never had more data in our lives. Oh, yes. And I started going through it, right? Repetitions, repetitions. And then I, I, I came across it. I was out on a run. Right? Very Einsteinian of me. I was out on a run when I had the realization that what if we were to start with just the one word and then look the other direction, not look at the content and the data, but let's start finding stories. So I created a base, I gamified storytelling. And we have a couple of parameters that we set up. And then every day you get a word. And then we just write to that word. Like, what does that mean to you? What is your personal connection to the to this word? Right. And it can be things as, as simple as car and vacation and uh, just the, the words that surround us. And what ends up One coming word. out is a ability for people to go into the limbic mind, right? And this is something you speak to when you speak to uh, talking to both brains. Mm -hmm. The big one that I focus on that we have a tendency to neglect is that limbic mind. And in the limbic mind, there, there's no words, there's no language, there's just feelings, emotions, and experiences. So I've reverse engineered and just we just tap into the bottomless story well that resides within each one of us and experiences and start pulling those things forth. Once we pull those stories forth, we as, uh, as beings automatically start searching for meaning to whatever it is that, uh, that we recall, right? So if it's something like, well, we shared this before we got started talking about stop signs turning into yield signs. Mm -hmm. And I parlayed it into a very short story of growing up in my neighborhood. It was all yield signs until someone ran the yield sign and had an accident and indicate a stop sign. And that's right. why we have rules and regulations. So uh, taking simple short stories and attaching meaning to them. And it's been, been transformative for, mm -hmm. for the people that I work with and, and really for myself as well is, is this practice of just continually tapping into into stories and experiences. And what ends up happening is you come across some that you haven't thought of in the longest time, and then we're able to take that and shape it and mold it. And now you've got a story that you can start a presentation with to where you're capturing your entire audience. As opposed to putting up the PowerPoint and here's all the numbers, we start with a really simple short story. We engage the audience, we pull them in, and then we attach that meaning and content to them. And that becomes a memorable experience for them. 
Okay. I love some of the phrases that you're using. I was taking notes here. I, I love your, your reference to the bottomless story well that we all have. <laughs> so uh, are there particular techniques that you tend to use across different coaching clients to help them uh, uncover some of those stories and their bottomless story well? Yeah. One of the first games that we uh, play, and I, I use games and game play because games. It, it's... Uh, it helps you become a little more at ease. People like playing games. There isn't necessarily anything pretentious. The, the, there isn't a high stakes component to it, and it's a bit more playful. So it mm -hmm. lowers the level of stress. I and mean, we both know that when we stress, the, the frontal lobes get a, get a cramp and they shut down and creativity goes out the window. So one of the first things I do is I, I put people in a state of ease. Like, we're just, we're just going to play a couple games. You have all the answers to this. Let me give you a couple of cues. And the first cue that I give is really a release and a permission. I give you permission to get into the same mindset as Allen Ginsberg, the poet, who described the writing of his poetry as first thought, best thought. He's like, I just relax my mind and whatever mm -hmm. comes into it, that's what I wrote down. And he would write that way. Then naturally he would go back and, and edit it and, and tweak it, but he stayed in a uh, first thought, best thought state of mind. So that's the first tenet that I teach is when you, when you want to be creative, your mind is unbelievably powerful and incredibly creative. So let it do what it wants to do. Mm. It really pivots into the second tenant. The second tenant is uh, comes from improv, and it is yes and yes and yes. yes I love doing yes and exercises. It, it's a it's a great way to carry forth a conversation, right? When someone says no, but conversation's over. Well, we have right. conversations with our minds all the time, and when that first thought, best thought, pops in your head, and you know, but it conversation's over with your mind as well. Your mind's not going to give you something else. But if you just get in the habit of saying that first thought, best thought that I got, yes, and what is my personal connection? What is my moment in time where something happened with that? And then the last tenant that I teach really, really takes uh, until we get into the latter part and we've played the game a bunch of times and you're comfortable with the yes and and the first thought, best thought. The third one is free association. Mm -hmm. You are free to move wherever within your mind that you'd like to go. So if you're on a thought track and you're thinking about puppies and dogs and suddenly a memory of, you know, kindergarten and this, this dog being there, and the teacher was there, the teacher uh, is, is, is a pivot point for you because something memorable happened, you created this piece of art. You're allowed to make that jump and now think about that piece of art that you created or that the thing that happened, the field day in, in elementary school, right? Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. Think about that. We take a word as a jumping off point to just go back into our memories and experiences and just look around and explore things. And I do it in a very tight period of time so you don't have much time to ruminate. Once we've come across right. a couple of, of, of memories and experiences, we'll take one of those and then a huge part of become, about becoming a huge storyteller, by becoming a storyteller, mm -hmm. and is to tell stories. Just get in the habit of just telling stories, finding a story, something that happened this weekend, shape it and craft it, give it a location, give it some, uh, some tackiness to it, give it some substance, mm -hmm. and just tell the story. And get in the tell habit the story. of just telling stories. So a huge part of what we teach uh, with articulated intelligence is when we want to search, then we want to shape it, and then we want to share. And we stay in that constant state of, of searching, shaping, and sharing, searching, shaping, and sharing. Because what ends up happening eventually, and I've, I've, I've gotten feedback on this from some of the business professionals that I work with, is they'll be sitting in a board meeting and their, their boss asks them a question. And because they're in a habit of playing this game, they'll ask questions or instantly go back to the limit of mind, find an experience. It just, it, it's incredible how things just materialize in your mind. Like you can see it clear as day. We'll take a moment to shape it and then just tell the story and attach the meaning and the content to it. And the results that they've seen from this is they have a higher level of trust with the people that they work with. Mm -hmm. They have a higher level of people remembering the stories and the points that they were making. And the points, yeah. And, and that's a huge thing in, if you're sitting in a board meeting or if you're in a panel discussion or wherever you may be, having that ability to connect with your entire audience and speak to the whole brain, which is, I loved your speech the other day, speaking to uh, to, uh, to, to both systems modalities. one and two systems mm -hmm. one yeah right right 
How fascinating. And and so who are the, the clients you typically work with with the system? You talk about people in business, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's been a big focus of mine. So I uh, had a long time standing contract before all this awesomeness happened. Uh, I worked with Holland and Hart. So with uh, with lawyers, so they have to come up with great points of arguments and Holland and Hart. And uh-huh. yeah. being able to pull four stories and share stories is, is huge for them to be able to connect with their entire audience. Uh, I've worked with companies like Danone. Here in the United States, we call them Danon. Danon, like, like Danone. Know, mm-hmm. I know Danone. someone who works at that company. Yeah. Um, I've had a chance to work with uh, Prologis, which is an industrial real estate company here downtown Denver. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also, I had a long, long time contract working with Orange Theory Fitness, working with their, okay. their coaches. Mm-hmm. And a huge part of their coaching was to have that presence and to be able to connect with the, the, the members that come in. Because the, the thing that they do is before class starts, each coach has a moment where they basically have like a small town hall. They have a chance to introduce themselves, talk about what's happening today, what we're going to get into from a workout standpoint, get everybody riled up, and then move into, into the workout. Mm-hmm. That little moment, right, because it's, it's such a short period of time, is, is critical to be able to capture everybody's enthusiasm and attention and to bring them on board and to get that, that yeah. rally. What is we're about to do? Which is actually part of the reason why I do what I do is because I was in a town hall. We had a new president. I was working with a company that had gone through massive tumult. My director had left. I became the interim director. The VP had quit. The president had quit. And the, uh, the company was looking for a new president. They found one. They looked for like a year. So we were basically a wow. ship at sea. On, 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 we were a legacy company. And we were fractured. Right? Oh, goodness. A new president comes in a new ray of hope. And he has this incredible opportunity that he wasted and squandered. Oh, no. Calls, calls a town hall, a huddle, that's what we called it. And everybody comes in and he stands before us and it's his moment to galvanize and get the rally cry going. And he ums and he ahs and oh. he and he goes off topic and never gets to the point and it was lost. From there on, every huddle that he would have, people wouldn't get in close. They'd all stand far back. They'd have pieces of paper out and they would be keeping track Track. of how many times he ummed and odd. And they'd look at you like, I got 27, I got 35. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. And at that moment, I realized that unintentional audience abuse is preventable. Unintentional audience abuse. I love that phrase. Because he doesn't mean to do this. He's, he's nervous. Uh, he's uh, not prepared. And what mm-hmm. he's doing is unintentional. He doesn't want to do this. He doesn't want to no. hurt the people that he's speaking to. He clearly not. Does. Clearly not. And you and I both know that public speaking and, and storytelling, these things, it's a, it's, it's a learned trait. Yes. We practice this. We hone this in order to be able to connect with our audience. And that's why I, I figured, I'd say, I've, I've had a coaching background. I've had a personal training business for the past 15 years now, I think it is, yeah, about 15 years. It was a full-time business until the downturn in the economy in 2008 that just wiped out my business and I pivoted into, uh, into global sales. Mm, mm-hmm. but it, it, so the coaching side of me is still there and I realized that I, I can help people. I can, I can help it elevate levels of confidence, I can help them fine tune their delivery. I can help. And in October of 2017, I left corporate America with the intent of starting a business. And now I'm on to my second business. I started having a business called Stage Coaching, which is really about the one on one coaching. And I have another business called Articulated Intelligence, mm-hmm. where I have a business partner. Uh, we're about to hire a, uh, I'm going to call her the president of the company because I need a boss. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that is articulate intelligence. And we have a, I've created a, a collection of, how can I say this? We have a curriculum. A curriculum. A okay. curriculum. Yeah. It's a, we have two four part master classes. Uh, we do some standalone uh, work uh, as well called trust working, which mm-hmm. is uh, helping people really just connect in any social setting, especially a virtual one. But we teach three very important things. How to listen. Mm. How to align. You like dogs? 
I like dogs. We have so much in common. And okay. then the very important one is how to inquire, right? When you're in a conversation with someone and they're speaking, if you inquire about something they said, and it doesn't matter what it is, but you just ask a question, what you're doing is you're keeping the spotlight on them. You're mm-hmm. also filling them with, with huge levels of, of dopamine because yeah. in their mind, they're like, wow, this person is actually listening to me. They're interested yes. in what I'm saying, and they want to hear more about what I have to say. They want to hear more. That's right. That's such a great feeling, isn't it? It's such a great feeling. And the person who's feeling this is trusting you, the person who's asking this, even more. Like the levels of trust just go up. So in a social setting, and I teach this as, as a way to win at networking. And the way you win at networking is to be the last person to ask what is oftentimes the first question and also the last question in a networking event. What's the most popular question that gets asked? What do you do? So what do you do? I think it's a horrible question. Of course. One, that's not who I am. We're not getting to, to, to know each other. It's superficial. And two, if we don't connect on that fine thread, conversation's over. That's right. But instead, if you come in with a really, really big question, like, What's the most outrageous purchase that you didn't think you were to make in 2020? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Like for you, I, I, I have a feeling I know the answer. It's a dog. Like we're never going to get a dog. And like, I just, I had a line like, oh, dogs, Oof, that's, that's, a, that's a big purchase. Why did you get a dog? And I just start asking you questions and I keep you engaged. What ends up happening in this setting is I keep the spotlight on you. And eventually you're going to be like, man, this is, this is going so well. I have to play also. And not knowing the, uh, the rules of the game, not you will rules. instantly lean in and be like, so Keith, what do you do? And at that point, I got you. Because I'm going to lead in with my pitch. Right? right? AI help prevent unintentional audience abuse, which gets you to lean back in and ask me automatically, How what do you does do that? that mean? Does How that do mean? you do that? Right? Mm-hmm. And from a pitch standpoint, if we think about baseball, the pitcher always wants the ball back in his hand. Every time he throws the pitch, the ball ends up back in his hand. And he wants the batter to take a swing at whatever he throws at him. Right. right? So in a pitch, when I throw the, the big Y out there, we're getting to Simon Sinek's uh, golden circle, is lead with Y. Mm-hmm. Why I do what I do is to prevent unintentional audience abuse. And you automatically lean in, like, tell me more. Well, the ball's back in my hand. Now I get to throw you another pitch. I suppose he's saying... That's a great analogy. You, right? I suppose he's saying to you, I'm a professional storyteller. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't care about that. Or I'm a dentist, or I'm a lawyer. Like dime a dozen. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's <laughs> it's about what you can do for me. That's that's the key to networking. Is what what can you do for me? What is the what is the benefit I stand to gain from continuing this conversation with you? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. How interesting. How interesting. I've m- made a number of notes here of some of the phrases you've used, search, shape, share, listen, align, inquire. You've really got this uh, down, to a, down to a science, it sounds like. We're going to take a short break and hear from our sponsor. And when we come back, I'd like to go deeper into some of the techniques that you use. Right. And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and see what it would sound like for you to use one of those techniques on me and see, oh. see if you can draw a new story out of me. Are you I, game? I'm totally game. I feel 100% confident that you and your listeners are going to hear a story that you haven't told in a long, long time. Wow. All right. I'm looking forward to that. We'll be right back. You are a knowledgeable expert, and you want your expertise to make a difference to your audience but you can't see them engage their reactions. Therefore, you need new tools for engaging that unseen audience. Hi, I'm David Odie, offering you a way to pick up those tools. In my new self-paced online course, you will discover three ways to improve your story, one fascinating tool for hooking your audience's attention, and eight details in your physical environment that will set you apart from other virtual presenters. Today's technical presentations are going virtual. And that means you can reach a wider audience as long as you understand how to serve that audience. So join me for the online course, Own the Virtual Stage. Confidently connect with an unseen audience. Just go to ownthevirtualstage.com for details.
And we are back. David Odie here on the Power of Story and Science with my guest, Keith Bailey of Articulated Intelligence. And we're going to do a little experiment right here in real time for the benefit of the audience. Keith is going to take me through one of his processes and draw a story out of me. And it'll be a story that I haven't shared in any of my books or on this podcast. And we're just going to do a little bit of this. Uh, well, I wasn't going to say free association, but that's not the first step, is it? That's that's a later step. So free association yeah, is, is the third step. We're actually going to focus on the uh, the, the, the first the first tenant. The first the, tenant. The first thought, best tenant. thought. Yeah. So we're going to play a really fun game. Uh, okay. this, is, this is not a game of my creation. It's been around for a long time. I actually learned about it from a gentleman by the name of Matthew Dix, who okay. wrote an incredible book that we all need to read. If you're interested in storytelling, uh, read Story Worthy by Matthew Dix. In fact, if you love speaking and want to get better at speaking, I recommend the audiobook version first. I listened to about Story three times. Worthy? Ago. Was that the title? Story, story Worthy. Yeah, story, story Worthy. worthy. Uh, one word somewhere on my bookshelf here. If I see it, I'll grab it for us real quick. Mm -hmm. I don't see it jumping out at me. Yeah, it's uh, Matthew Dix is the Grand Slam winningest storyteller for a, uh, uh, a show called The Moth. And The Moth, they basically bring you in. They have a topic. <clears throat> you come in and tell your story. There's people in the audience that are judges. They score you. And if you win a Moth Slam, then you move on to a Grand Slam. And he's won something like 28 Moth Grand Slams. And he is wow. Incredible storyteller. Must be. I, if, if he is the benchmark, right? If he is the A plus performer that we, we look up to from storytelling, I'm probably a B plus. He's that good. He's okay. that good. And, and he's got just such sage advice and information from storytelling. Because every story, and this is this is in his in his book, every story is about a five second moment in time. Oh, I love that. Yeah, Where because stories have got to be about moments. Something happens. Everything you tell before that moment supports the moment. Mm -hmm. Everything you tell after that moment is as a result of the moment. As a result. So yeah, if, what if changes as a result of that moment, right? Correct. He also speaks to that stories are about change over time. Mm -hmm. right? I used to think this, these things happened to me. Now I think this. Now I think this, yes. And from a from a storytelling standpoint, when we share that with with their audiences in a professional setting, they're, we talk about they're like they're there along with us. They they experience the same transformation that we experience. So if you want to convince somebody or sway somebody to your reasoning of thinking, telling them a story about a change over time puts them in that moment, and has them go through that exact same change that right. you experienced. So now, now they they're will. with you, and now you can give your reasoning why they should think the way that you think. Mm -hmm. As opposed to going like, well, you should think this way. You're like, not gonna do it. Right. So, so to 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 the game, to the game. So the game we're gonna play. I actually learned about it in this book, Story Worthy, and it just ties really well into the uh, the storytelling that I that I do. And it's a game called First Best Last Worst. First uh, Best Last okay. Worst. Have you played this before? Have you heard of this? I've heard of this. First Best Last, last Worst. Worst. Okay. I'm going to give you a word. Okay. And then I want you to think about your first interaction with it, your best, your last, and your worst. Just just, yeah, just think of those. Okay. Don't overthink it. Okay. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to think about it. Okay. What's nice about this, you have all the answers. The word is, sure. you ready? Yeah. The word is vacation. What was your first vacation? vacation you can recall? What's your best vacation you would call your last vacation and your worst vacation? If everyone pops in, let it be so. The first vacation oh, I can on. recall. Hold, no? Hold on, hold on, hold on one second. Just, okay. I just want you to think about your first vacation. All right. I want you to think about your best vacation, right? your last and your worst. So there's, a, there's another prompt coming up. Oh, okay. 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 You, right. you, I'm you thinking picture, about those. Can you, can you picture it first? Can you picture your best? Okay. Your let, me, your let me picture them. All right. Picturing my first. Okay. Picture my last. Okay. Picturing my best. Okay. Worst vacation. And that's okay if you can't think of one. Yeah. 
I, I don't know that I would have automatically put it okay, in we would let that go. We don't, vacation, but I think we I don't, we don't want to ruminate, right? No, we no, 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 no. I, have it. I have it. All right. So first, best, last, first, you've got, you've got a vacation for each. Now what I want you to think about mm -hmm. yeah. is a five second moment of time where something happened in one of those vacations and whatever the brightest one is, will rise to the very top and it's there top of mind right now. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Now what you do is I want you to take a moment and, and put yourself back in that location. Look around, look around, like where, where, where is it? What's the location? Who, who is there? What are you doing? What's the activity? Some of the little granular things that make a story tactile, right? Like I was wearing a purple bathing suit covered in zinc oxide lotion. Like that paints a picture for us. So, so put yourself in that moment. Okay. Live there for a bit, like go back to there again. And now tell us a 45 second to a minute story about whichever vacation this is and what happened, David, we want to know. About one of those vacations. When I was little, I'm from Southeast Texas originally, and my family had moved to near Dallas. And we used to go back to Port Arthur, Texas for summer vacations to see the grandparents. And the one scene that jumps out at me was the time we were getting ready to leave my grandparents, my maternal grandparents' house on Fifth Avenue in Port Arthur, Texas. And we were standing at the front door. The way I remember it is the bags were packed and the car was loaded. And my grandfather, whom I adored, turned and said, well, can David stay a while longer? And as I recall, that was the first of a number of times when one of my sisters or me would stay and have our own vacation with our grandparents. And that was so special to me because I must have been about five years old and my maternal grandfather died when I was not quite seven. And I didn't have a lot more vacation times with him, although I had vacation times with my other grandparents. But I felt so big at that time. I was looking into their living room and getting ready to tell it goodbye. And I loved that space. It was a space where we had a lot of family Christmases. And I can remember what a Christmas tree looked like in the corner. But this wasn't Christmas time. This was summer. And we were getting ready to leave. And I heard the cicadas droning outside. And I could smell the the magnolia tree that was in the front yard that was always in bloom when we were there visiting. And my parents said, yes, you can stay longer. And I just felt 10 feet tall. That's a beautiful story. I love all the details. Like I can hear the cicadas, right? I grew up in Kansas and I can just hear the That's right. <laughs> What's the last time you told that story? Was the last time you thought of that? I, I've never told the story, and I can't think of the last time I thought of it. <laughs> Brand new story. But what we would do with that story is mm -hmm. take it, build it out further, add more detail to it, but then also what's, what's, what's the meaning behind that story, right? Yes. It, uh, I mean, I, I can think of many different things, right? There's a lot of things you can attach to that story mm -hmm. as, as meaning. One is is make your, if we think from a business say, like you want to make your your customers, your your clients feel special, mm -hmm. feel wanted, right? My uh -huh. grandfather did that. He 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 chose me. He made me feel ten feet tall. When we shine the lights and we care about our customers, they feel ten feet tall. Right. That's or if you have something else within your messaging as far as your, your business is concerned, or whatever, maybe you can attach that meaning to that story. Now shape the story even more so. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if we're going to go back to a change over time. Right. Is right. Uh, during the vacation there, I felt like I was ignored and no one wanted to hang out with me or something happened. Mm -hmm. like my sister's teasing me, like things happened to make us not yeah. feel that way. Mm -hmm. And then as the car was packed, like I, I was there, like I, I was so waiting for the next words to come out of your mouth, like what happens next? But to have that story arc of, of I felt this way, then grandpa did this to me, and this is what it means to me. Therefore, I do this for my clients. Mm, yes, I, I right. I see where you go with that. Feel 10 feet tall. You can draw a business lesson right out of that, right out of something that happened when I was five.
That's powerful technique. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, the first, last, best, worst. Yep. I like that. Super fun game. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it allows you to do those three things. Search, shape, and then share. You Sharing right. is critical. It's critical to share, whether you're sharing it with, with a loved one, talking to your dog, having a, a conversation with a business professional, whoever it may be, tell stories. The more stories you tell, the better you get. That's right. The more stories you tell, the better you get. And I love that your focus goes from first, last, best, worst, which brings some powerful scenes to mind. But then before I could tell the story, had me drill down on a five-second moment. And so for me, that was that moment when I got invited to stay. Or in another story that I didn't tell you, the moment when my daughter found the bottle of wine in the creek and my wife had to explain that it was ours. We had put it there to chill. <laughs> you know, moments like this that come back from different vacations yeah. that we've taken. That, what a great technique. What yeah. a great technique. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to see what comes forth and to hear people's experiences. Because one thing that Matthew Dix talks about also is what is most common is most universal. Yeah, that's right. Because in stories, you have, you have your unique events that happen to you with unique characters in your story. And yet what makes stories powerful is their universality. Okay. Because in your story, I've, I've been to Texas. I've never been to Port Arthur, but I've been to a port. Okay. I, I too have had a grandfather, although I never met them because they died before I was born. I still had a grand, I still had grandparents. Mm -hmm. right? uh, I, I too was five years old and I have memories of being five years old. All these things we have in common. So when you tell your story, and especially the way that you tell it, like I've, I've gone on vacations, I've gone on car trips, I've seen a car packed to the hills with luggage especially back in those days, like hard case luggage. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, uh, you know, the, the thing that we would get into is giving the, the, the car a name and perhaps even a color. Oh, right? yes. Just, just, and that's that when, I, when I talk about granular details, it's those little things that just, and the person who's listened to the story just materializes and makes it even more clear. Yes. Right? Is, is, is we're, we're all there with you. So stories, when we tell stories, and this uh, <laughs> um, a piece of pushback that I get that is uh, like, oh, nothing major has ever happened to me. I didn't summit Mount Everest. I didn't survive a plane crash. <clears throat> Those are not relatable stories. No. But I can't. Every, stories have happened to everyone because what I like to say is wherever desire meets obstacle, there's a story. Desire because the story is who helped you get past or over or around or under that obstacle and what did you learn from that yeah yeah so i have one question for you um you were talking about the granularity of the detail and i i thought about it, it wasn't that vacation but for many years my family had a blue plymouth station wagon named stanley stanley station wagon <laughs> It was probably later than that story when I was five years old. No. Um, but the other thing that can happen, though, is I hear storytellers sometimes get too bogged down in the description. And so what I try to help people to do is to t give enough description to draw us into the scene and let us fill out some of the details in our own mind. How do you do that? I, I come from an abundance mindset. So when we first start shaping the story, we've researched it, now we shape it, we add everything into it. We make it mm. way too robust. And then we go okay. in and start start trimming down. And start start from an abundance down. mindset. I like it's, that. Yeah, if, if you, let's say in the story about, uh, about your grandfather, if you started getting into too much detail on the car and started explaining the car too much, now we've lost focus of where we are. So we'd want to trim right. that down, right? And, but if you were to say that and all the packs were packed into um, into the blue station wagon or, or in, in, into Buster, our yeah. blue station wagon, right? <laughs> like if you were to put it that way, that just gives the car a name. And it's, and it's a fun little tease, but we're not spending too much time ruminating in that car and getting into those granular details. But it does anchor a name to something that is in your story. I like so that. usually I go yeah. from, from I, I like to go really, really big and wide and then bring it back together again. 
and bring then it, go yeah. wide and then bring yeah. it back down and make sure that the moment doesn't get lost. Yeah, got to have that moment there. This has been a conversation with Keith Bailey about the techniques he uses to draw from that bottomless story well he says we all have. I'm going to do something I've not yet done in this program, and that is to divide this conversation across two episodes. In our next episode, we'll pick up the conversation again and hear more about Keith's work in helping people shape their stories including a great story about working with a scientist right here in Denver. Please join us. If you can't wait till then to get in touch with Keith, you can email him using keithbailey at stage-coaching.com or visit his website articulated-intelligence.com. Until next time, this is David Odie on The Power of Story and Science. You can find the audio version of this program on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you like to find your podcasts. And you can reach me with your questions or suggestions by going to storyandscience.com. Thanks for watching.